So I welcome everyone. I see people are joining. We're at 150 people right now. So we're just going to um, give it a couple minutes, let folks get a chance to get on, get our Facebook live stream going, and then we'll be ready to rock and roll. That light's not good, right? It's okay. Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, this is our first in a series of webinars with Robert M. Schwartz. Tonight we'll be discussing uh, Intro to Just Cause and we're so happy that all of you could make it. Um, my name is Bianca Cunningham. I am a staff organizer at Labor Notes. Uh, Labor Notes, for those of you who don't know, is a mixed media project. We've been around for 41 years now. Uh, it consists of a magazine that gets published monthly that covers struggles, rank and file struggle, struggles from their own perspectives. We like to say we're trying to put the movement back in labor movement. And the other piece of the work that we do um, is doing trainings and offering things like troublemaker schools and events that are open to the public or uh, rank and file union members or union activists in general so that we can teach stuff about um, how to organize uh, based on our book, uh, Secrets of a Successful Organizer, and a host of others um, that, a host of other trainings that we offer. And so we do both training and we do publication. We're so happy um, to have our guest tonight, Robert M. Schwartz. Um, and we will go ahead and get started. So quickly. Robert M. Schwartz grew up in New York and attended Randy University, where he studied under Professor Herbert Marcuse, sometimes called the father of the new left. A member of Students for a Democratic Society, or SDS, Schwartz organized against the Vietnam War, supported striking UAW workers, and helped lead a successful campaign for, recent con for rent control excuse me, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Schwartz has been a member of four unions. In one workplace, a South Boston warehouse, he helped to organize a Teamsters local. After graduating from law school in 1976, Schwartz represented the United Electrical Workers, worked as a hearing officer for the Massachusetts Labor Relations Commission, and served as a partner in, a union, side, in, in union side law for, firms. Currently, Schwartz concentrates on writing, teaching, and training. He is a frequent speaker at union meetings, conferences, and conventions. He lives in Boston, where he is a bicycle and tennis enthusiast. Um, welcome, Robert. Thank you, Bianca. Glad to be here uh, with all the, uh, with however many attended. Do we know the number, perhaps? Is it, uh, I know that's- We're sitting at about 250 right now. 
Well, that's a lot of people to be in my house at the same time. Um, so some of you know me because I've been writing handbooks. That's the main thing that, is, that people know. I, I've been writing labor law handbooks for about 35 or 40 years. And the books have been very popular because they try to answer uh, practical questions in a simple, straightforward way. Uh, one of the books, the first book I wrote was called The Legal Rights of Union Stewards. And that's probably the most popular of the books. But um, the book we're going to talk about tonight and the, and the issues is, is called Just Cause, A Human Guide to Winning Discipline Cases. And this book is uh, published by Labor Notes and is available on their store. Uh, the price, the store was closed for a while during the uh, worst months of the pandemic and it's now back open. The book uh, the price of the book is twenty dollars, and uh, they ask for six dollars for postage for each book, and then it drops down if you buy more than one. So hopefully, some of you have the book. The first edition of the book came out in two thousand and twelve. The second edition came out in two thousand and eighteen. Whenever I do something that involves technology and such as Zoom meeting or anything else with a computer or a microphone, uh, I'm reminded uh, about the story of the union president and the company CEO, uh, which involved technology. Uh, it was in Pennsylvania and there was a factory that uh, had uh, notified the union that it was laying off about 20% of the workforce, uh, mainly people in the maintenance department. Well, the union president immediately demanded a meeting with the company CEO uh, to try to bargain uh, a change in the decision. Uh, he was invited to come to the CEO's private office and he, uh, and he arrived. And there was a long table and uh, at the table was the company CEO as well as the company's head lawyer. So all three individuals sat down at the table, they shuffled their papers and the union president began to make his presentation. At that very moment, the company CEO stood up and said, I'm sorry, Jack, I just remembered, I have to uh, speak with my vice president. We have a very important guest coming in later today. I have to go over a few points. At that point, he started talking into his lapel to his vice president. The union, as the union president was kind of uh, upset, but also impressed. He says, wow. He has a two-way in his lapel because this was several years ago before two ways were very common. Well, when the conversation was finished, uh, the union president stood up to begin his presentation. At that time, the company lawyer interrupted and said, "Jack, I'm really sorry. I've got a brief due uh, later today. I've got to give my lesson and instructions to my associate." And he started talking into his watch to his associate, going over the brief. Well, the union president said that's uh, very impressive. He's got a two-way in his watch. The, president, the other guy has a two-way in his lapel. Uh, I've got to do something. So at that point, he uh, stood up and said, uh, guys, uh, we'll have to wait a few minutes. I have to see a man about a horse. And at that point, he got up and walked out of the room. Five minutes later, he came back to the room. And when he entered the room, the company CEO and the company lawyer started to laugh. Why? because there was from, from, the, from the union president's pants, from his belt, there was toilet paper coming down outside his belt and then down his leg to the floor and then out the floor to the hall. Well, the company CEO and the company lawyer thought that was the funniest thing they ever saw. And the uh, company CEO bent over and said, Jack, you won't believe this, but you've got toilet paper coming out of your butt. I'll help you. I'll just lean over here and snap it off. At that point, the union president turned to both of them and said, don't touch that. That's a fax coming in from the international. Well, hopefully uh, somebody got <laughs> the point of that. Yes. Right. Um, I just do want to note really quick, Robert, that um, some folks are saying that they are struggling to hear. There's some feedback. So I wonder if we can get closer to the mic. Okay, uh, let's see if I do this. 
How about if I put the mic right in front of me? Is this better? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, all right. That was my one joke and uh, my one laugh. And now I think we can start the workshop. This uh, workshop concerns how to make effective arguments in discipline cases uh, using the principles of just cause. Just cause is a very important part of the union contract. Some people might argue that just cause is the most important article in the union contract. There would be a debate. Obviously, pension is important, seniority is important, uh, layoffs is important, subcontracting is important. But you could also argue that without the just cause clause, everything else falls apart. That without just cause, there really couldn't be a union uh, because, and, and therefore, there wouldn't be any way to enforce the contract. Without just cause, the employer could discharge anyone they wanted on any basis whatsoever. Without the just cause clause, union members would be at will employees, just like the non-union sector of the workforce in the United States. Uh, without just cause, a union president could be fired for being late five minutes. Um, the chief steward could be fired. The, the regular steward could be fired. In fact, it would be such that no one would be uh, uh, brave enough I can't imagine anyone being brave enough to take the job of a union representative in those situations. The union would be a shell, the contract would be a joke. That's why I think it's fair to say that the union, that the just cause clause is the most important portion of the contract. The unions have had just cause clauses in their contracts probably since about 1935, 1938. At this point, uh, it appears that about 95% of unions have a just cause clause in their contract. The only uh, major areas of union uh, in the union world that don't have just cause is two industries. One is the construction trades, such as the carpenters, such as the glaziers, the electricians. And the other, one, the other uh, sector would be the entertainment world, such as union um, actors, union actresses, directors, producers. In both the construction and the entertainment world, employees have no protection against discharges, and uh, the employers can let people go at will. Why this happened, what historical forces led to that, uh, I, don't, I don't know. It would be an interesting uh, research study. Uh, of the 95% that have just cause clauses, most of them say something to the following. The, the, no employee shall be discharged or disciplined without just cause. Some contracts use a little different language. They say reasonable cause, or they say proper cause, uh, or they might say good cause. And some employers think, well, we don't have just cause, we have good cause, that's better, that's not as tough as just cause. And they think they've achieved something by changing the language from just cause to good cause. But they're surprised because when the cases that arise uh, are taken up the ladder, to, especially to arbitration, they find that arbitrators apply the same standards to a contract with good cause, with reasonable cause, uh, with proper cause, and with just cause. So we're all in the same boat. Uh, another point that makes it uh, fun for me to give, give this workshop is that unlike other areas of labor law, uh, just cause is the same in both the public sector and the private sector. So that uh, the way we apply just cause is the same, both for public employees as well as for private sector employees. Um, now, uh, when in the, in, at first, when unions started to file just cause grievances and take cases to arbitration, the decisions that came down from arbitrators were a little clumsy, a little unclear. Why? Because the definition of just cause is not that is not is not self-evident. Uh, we can go around this whole room of 250, 300 people, ask for best definition of just cause, and we would get 300 different definitions. Uh, it's a it's 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 a kind of amorphous language, ambiguous language. Uh, some arbitrators said, I can't, you know, this is a difficult language for me to apply, um, but uh, I'll do my best. I think I know it when I see it. Um, well, that doesn't help the union too much because that doesn't help you frame a case. That doesn't help you develop a case because you don't know what standards the arbitrator is going to apply. Uh, so I would say for the first 
10, 20 years, it was frustrating for you to pursue uh, discipline cases. In the 1960s, an arbitrator in Chicago, his name, uh, unusual name, named Carol Dorgan. Uh, he was an arbitrator who heard a lot of cases in the railroad sector. He was frustrated just like the unions, and he determined to try to do something about it and to categorize the elements of just cause, the accepted and agreed on elements of just cause, agreed on among the arbitration profession. The professionals will hear the disputes as they uh, go up the ladder. And he came up with something called the seven tests of just cause. Uh, and he applied it to all the cases that he heard. And he would either put it in the decision and then talk about each principle, or he would sometimes attach a boilerplate seven tests of just cause at the end of his decision. Well, unions were pleased with this development because now for the first time, they had a checklist. They had a list of what is just cause and what isn't just cause. Um, it was something that helped them to prepare cases and to present cases. So unions were, have been, were enthusiastic about the Dorgity or the Dorgity seven tests. Unfortunately, the arbitration profession was mixed in reaction to Dorgity. After all, in a way, he was a competitor of theirs. Uh, they're all competing to get cases from unions. Dorgerty comes out with seven tests. Some of them didn't want to go along with it simply out of pride. But others also objected to the seven tests on a few more, uh, more uh, realistic uh, uh, reasons. Um, for example, Dorgerty had said in his seven tests that an uh, employer that uh, could not win a discharge case in arbitration unless the employer could prove that he carried out a full and fair and objective investigation. Which sounds good. However, many arbitrators said, well, really, that's, I'm not, you're telling me that I have to overturn the case. Uh, a case is taken to me of an employee who, uh, I'm convinced, stole $10,000 worth of merchandise from the employer. They have all kinds of witnesses uh, uh, that he stole this merchandise. He had admitted it in his interrogation. Um, you want me to turn, to put this worker back to work with back pay probably, because you're able to show me that the employer did not do a full investigation. The employer only interviewed three of the six possible witnesses. The employer did not review the entire uh, background and record of the employer before it made its decision. Um, well, arbitrators don't, didn't agree with that. They said if the employer can come to an arbitration hearing and present solid proof of misconduct, of serious misconduct, I'm going to find uh, the employee guilty and I'm going to take the, the appropriate action. I'm not going to bother myself with how the particular investigation took place. Um, uh, and they rejected Dorgerty. They turned against Dorgerty. Another problem with Dorgerty's tests, he doesn't mention progressive discipline as a requirement of just cause. But by the 1960s and certainly by the 70s and 80s, almost all unions had won the concept, had, 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 had won agreement to the concept that discipline must be progressive. Now, discipline is not with the goal of punishing an employee, uh, like a criminal punishment. Discipline is to rehabilitate, to improve. Consequently, it's, it's necessary that an employer apply discipline in a progressive manner, starting with a low penalty, going to a middle penalty, and then, and only then, if the employee continues to offend, moving to a long suspension or discharge. Dorgerty's test also, for one reason or another, and I don't know why, he doesn't mention the concepts of extenuating and mitigating circumstances. Now, uh, some of you have been through this and some haven't, but over the years, we have proven, we have established within labor relations the concept that when an employer makes a disciplined decision, he's supposed to consider all the circumstances of the case, not just what happened on June 19, 2020, but the background of the employee, the accuser, the, the influences on the employee, why the employee might have done what he or she did. Was there a medical problem? Was this employee an excellent worker? Are there really good things about this employee that should be considered before determining what level of discipline is appropriate? But Dorgerty's tests don't give the, the arbitrator that option, and they deny the union, therefore, the ability to win cases that it could have won otherwise. When I set about writing a new handbook on just cause, at first I was going to just explain Dorgerty's seven tests. 
But when I discovered or realized that, that his tests are flawed, um, I decided to rewrite the seven tests. So, and I did that. And I have seven principles of just cause, which we're going to discuss tonight. And I think that these seven principles, I'm firmly convinced, uh, you can take to the bank. These principles are accepted within the labor relations world by both employers and by unions and by arbitrators. Uh, and my suggestion to you is that you, and when you investigate a grievance, that you apply, you look at it, and you look through the seven tests or seven principles. If you can find two or three principles that appear to be violated, those are what you should center on. Complete your investigation, develop your, inv your evidence, and present your case focusing on the one, two, or three principles which are violated. Some lawyers and union representatives have a different view. Their view is that, um, all right, there are seven principles of just cause. I'm going to present an argument that the employer has failed each of the seven principles. Uh, if I don't do that, I'm not doing my job. And they then they hit, they hit two or three, the good ones, and then they go through the other four or five, but they have no support, no evidence. And they're making kind of foolish arguments or frivolous arguments. Well, when you do that, it's like throwing stuff against the wall. You hope it sticks. But when you do that, you make an unconvincing presentation. You, you, you are saying to the arbitrator, I'm not really convinced that any one of these is very strong. I'm hoping that all seven together are strong. Arbitrator then concludes, you don't have faith in your case. My advice, my experience, 45 years or whatever it is, uh, is to pick your one, two, at the most, three points, three arguments. Develop them, present them, and rest your case. So with that as background, uh, Bianca, can we put up this, the nutshells, the seven uh, the, the basic principles of just cause in a nutshell? Sure. And I also just want to note that uh, sound is much better, um, but if you can just uh, be mindful about staying close to the mic. Okay. Thank you. All right. So this screen uh, is a nutshell of the seven principles of just cause that I have argued to you um, apply and have been accepted by the labor relations community. Number one, employers must inform employees of workplace rules. Number two, employers may not penalize employees for violating previously unenforced rules. Number three, employers must follow due process. Number four, employers must have substantial proof of misconduct. Five, employers must treat employees equally. Six, next slide, Bianca. The next slide has six, seven, and six and seven, I think. Do you see it? No, I don't see it. Well, that's okay. I'm just going to read it out. I, I don't see it on my screen. Number six. Oh, there it is. Six. Employers must apply progressive penalties. That's the progressive uh, discipline we were just talking about. And number seven. Employers must take account of mitigating, extenuating, and aggravating circumstances. Now, each one of these principles deserves discussion and uh, is something that you might be able to win a case on. Uh, but we're going to go to into, go into each one with some detail. And hopefully we can do it by the 8 o'clock, 8.15, and leave some time for questioning. Although I do, usually I take about three hours for this workshop, so let's see what happens. All right, number one, fair notice. Uh, fair notice in detail says, an employee may not be punished for violating a rule or standard whose nature and penalties are either self-evident or have been made known. And uh, this is a kind of a common sense principle. An employee should not be, you should not, you should not be able to punish a worker for violating a rule that that worker didn't know, have any reason to know about. That, that rule was not explained to the worker, was not given to the worker. Um, obviously that's unfair. And uh, it obviously is not just cause uh, uh, to do so. We used to win cases on fair notice because in a lot of cases times, Employers uh, just uh, put out their rules in a haphazard manner, or they announced them in departmental meetings. Uh, and then we would, we, would, we would make the argument that employee, this particular employee was never uh, given a talk about the rule in question, and we would sometimes win the case. In reaction, we now know that, and what employers do now is, is they write up all their rules, they put them in a handbook, and they distribute that handbook to the employee the first day of hire, or very, very quickly thereafter. 
And then to sew up the case for themselves, they ask the employee to sign a receipt saying that he or she has received the handbook. So uh, that has taken away our ability to win many cases on fair notice. Um, now, sometimes employees say, well, uh, yes, I may have gotten the handbook, and it may be in the handbook, but I'm a very poor reader, and uh, I, I don't really understand handbooks very well, and consequently, uh, I, I had no idea about this rule. I, I say you're talking a rule about drug, drug use or drug, drug testing. Uh, I had no idea that I could be tested when I returned from vacation uh, uh, about what happened while I was on vacation. Well, the rule says that, the rule explains that, but, and it's a, maybe a four page rule, <clears throat> and this worker didn't happen to read it. Can we win that case? Is that a case, is that a situation where we have proven that the employee did not have notice of the rule in question? Well, unfortunately, the answer is no. Uh, almost all arbitra arbitrators take the position that an employee is expected to read and understand written materials that are given to him. Or all uh, explanations of rules given in the department meeting <coughs> or otherwise. If a worker is not a good reader or doesn't understand what he's reading, he or she is expected to get help from either another worker, a shop steward, or the supervisor in question. He's not supposed to just say, well, I'm not a good reader, so I'm not gonna, I'm gonna take the handbook and put it in the, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the in Consequently, my advice is if you have an employee in your department who's not a reader, doesn't read, is maybe he's a little bit lazy or she's a little lazy. Uh, in that situation, my feeling is that the steward has a responsibility <coughs> to be proactive and to get ahead of the game by calling the worker aside, asking if the worker has read the handbook. Is there a section of the handbook that you're having trouble with? Is there a section of the handbook you want some help with? And then explaining what the rules require. Now you might say, I'm a steward, that's a job of a supervisor. And in a certain sense, you're right. But in a practical sense, in a, in a sense of saving somebody's job, uh, my view is that you should be proactive and you should explain the best you can the rules to your members. Now, uh, uh, one of the ways that uh, uh, this rule pops up, uh, when you represent somebody in a disciplinary interview, and as you all know, employers are expected, and they do, conduct disciplinary interviews before they pose discipline. In fact, as we discuss in the 10 minutes just, uh, due process, we'll see that the disciplinary interview is a requirement of just cause. But uh, when you get called as the steward, if a worker is, is called in for a disciplinary interview, uh, and if that worker has the presence of mind to, to request his or her steward, and you're called in as the steward, um, you're gonna show in, and you're gonna probably ask the employer, what are we, be, what are we here for? What is the nature of the, uh, of the investigation? And then you're probably gonna say, I would like to have a private course with this employee so I can prepare and help this worker prepare for the examination. These are your rights, and this is what all unions advise of their union representatives. When you meet with that worker, you will go over many things, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but you'll, you'll explain to the worker the need to stay cool, not to lose uh, control, uh, not to lie outright, uh, not to name witnesses, not to name other workers uh, who committed possible violations. And you'll go over perhaps a raft of things to help that worker deal with the examination. And when you do that, you might also tell that worker that it's very likely that the first question that the employer will ask during that interview, that they will turn to you and they will say to you, now you are aware, are you not, that we have a company rule against leaving the premises without permission of a supervisor. And the worker is expected to answer that question. Now, well, most workers would say, yes. Yeah, I know you have that rule. And then the employer will follow up and he will say, and you know that the company deals harshly with people who violate that rule. And they want the worker to say yes to that question because that satisfies fair notice. Now they have proven the worker knew the rule and he knew the punishment for the rule. Or at least he knew that the punishment could be severe, and that's really all the employer has to do. 
He doesn't have to give the precise punishment that will be applied, but he has to indicate whether it's a heavy punishment or a light punishment. But once this employee has admitted those two facts, he's heard his case. In fact, you might say he's very much heard his case uh, because he's admitted two of the necessary elements of just cause. My advice for you as a steward in that situation is to say to the worker, uh, you don't have to answer yes to those questions. Um, you need to qualify that. You might, you may, it may be better for you to qualify your answer. Uh, you might want to answer that yes, you know there's a rule, but no, you did not know it was a subject of a stiff punishment. And in fact, it was your understanding that the rule wasn't even being enforced in your area or your department. That is, you're not admitting that you are aware of the rules, that the rule is active and is being forced. This is good advice in dealing with uh, the first uh, requirement of just cause. Let's move on to the next uh, element of just cause, the next principle. Number two, active enforcement. Punishment may not be imposed for conduct that the employer has tolerated for a prolonged period. Now, this uh, principle actually relates to the first principle, fair notice. If uh, an employer doesn't enforce a rule for quite some time, what message is that employer sending to the workforce? The employer is sending a message that the rule doesn't apply any longer, or we no longer are applying this rule, or we're taking this rule off. That's the clear suggestion. When you don't enforce clear violations of a rule, you're telling workers the rule is no longer enforced. Consequently, you have violated uh, both rule principle one and principle two. And in that situation, the proper uh, remedy, when an employee is uh, can establish that he had reason to believe that, that the rule was not enforced, he didn't know about the rule, the rule was not enforced, then the proper remedy for that worker is full back pay, is reinstatement and full back pay that is to be made whole. Because that employee is not at fault. It's not partially at fault a little bit of fault, he's not at fault. When you violate a rule that you don't know about, or that you have reason to, good reason to believe, let's go back, good reason to believe uh, is not in place, you have not committed misconduct. Um, we also call this principle, another term that you might have heard about, it's called lax enforcement, L-A-X, lax enforcement. An employer who is guilty of lax enforcement cannot take action against an employee. Um, and we win a lot of cases on lax enforcement, um, in particular in two situations uh, that I see it. Uh, one is when a new, a new company, a new employer takes over a facility. Company is sold, a new manager comes in, a new owner comes in. When that new owner or new manager comes in, he goes over the, he starts, he takes a look at what the, uh, what, how rules are being enforced in the workplace and he's upset. He, he realizes that there are several rules or important concepts principles that are not being enforced in the workplace, lateness, absenteeism, uh, following all procedures, lockout rules, whatever it is, safety rules. So consequently, um, he determines as a new employer, he's gonna do what? He's gonna, he's gonna write the ship. He's gonna fix everything in one fell swoop. And from now on, I'm in charge. Every rule on the handbook is gonna be enforced 100%. In that situation, employees are caught up in a net they're pulled in, they're, they're penalized, they're punished in a situation where they had good reason to believe the rule was not in place. The, the rule had not, been, uh, had not been enforced for a significant period of time, several months at least, uh, and consequently it was, it was reasonable for that employee to believe the rule was wiped out, erased, off the books. The second uh, time I see this uh, big, a big problem with this principle is when an employee uh, has committed some violations or some bad work or some uh, safety violations and perhaps has uh, signed a last chance agreement. Uh, a last chance agreement is a document between the union, the worker, and management. Uh, the employer has enough evidence, he thinks or she thinks, to fire the worker but agrees to hold back uh, to give this employee a second chance for uh, and to, uh, as long as 
uh, the employee does not commit any further violations of, 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 of company policies. And perhaps that might be for a period of time of six months or one year or sometimes two years. Uh, and sometimes we, we sign these last chance agreements because we have no other choice. Because we know the employer has enough evidence to sustain a discharge. So now the employee comes back to work having signed a last chance agreement. Well, to some supervisors, that's the equivalent of coming back with what on the employee's back? A target, a bullseye. Uh, the supervisors in the shop look at that employer and they know that it, they can get this employee, they can, they, they can force him out, they can fire him for the most minute, smallest violation of any company rule. That's how they read the last chance agreement. So consequently, they come come down on that worker and they take action against that worker thinking they're going to be able to sustain a discharge. However, in that situation, they might oftentimes pick a rule that has not been enforced, an old rule, a rule that's dead, a rule that no one pays attention to, and they're going to apply that to that worker. They're going to fire that worker. They're going to be a hero to management. Well, we'll win that case because that's a situation of lax enforcement. That worker is guilty. That employer is guilty of lax enforcement. Uh, it's not fair in any way to uh, punish that work for violating a rule that has not been enforced. How do you win a last enforcement case? What do you have to prove? Two things, mainly. One, you need to prove that there are widespread violations of a rule in the shop. Um, not one violation of one person or two people, but widespread, 5, 10, 15, 20. Second, you have to prove that the employer was aware of those violations. The employer saw the violations, observed the violations, or was told about the violations. And then three, you have to uh, establish that no action was taken because of those violations. So that's three, three points that you need to prove. One, widespread violations. Two, no action taken. And three, uh, two, the employer was aware, and three, no action taken. How do you prove widespread violations by in the workforce? Well, this is a little tricky because to prove that to an arbitrator, to some neutral who's coming in, doesn't, is not in the shop, is not familiar with the shop, to prove to this arbitrator that there have been widespread violations, take that rule, leaving the premises without uh, notice or, or, or permission. How do you prove to the arbitrator that hundreds of workers or scores of workers have been doing this over the, over the last year or two years? The only way, real way, is for somebody to, give, to take the stand and to either say, I observed the violations, I saw my fellow employees doing this, or two, for someone to take the stand and say, I committed those violations. I committed those same violations. I did it right under the nose of my foreman. He said nothing to me. And uh, in a sense, admitting your own misconduct or a situation where you are describing the misconduct of other workers. It's a little touching. Because those workers, those other workers may be a little concerned that you are bringing their name into somebody else's case. And you are exposing the fact that they also violated the rule, maybe even more times than this worker. What can you say to those workers that would uh, prevent them from, from being really upset with you and the union? Well, uh, to answer that, uh, we might uh, draw their attention to another principle of just cause, uh, under the due process requirement, which says that employers must take action promptly after the discovery of misconduct. So what that means is that if uh, you take the stand at an arbitration and you describe misconduct that occurred six months or a year ago, can the employer now say, wow, I, that's new to me, Call those workers in, interview them, interrogate them, get them to admit that they left the premises without permission or whatever it was, and then take action. Well, the answer is no. That would be a violation of due process because you're taking action against a worker for what that worker did six months ago, 10 months ago, a year ago. That violates due process. So in a certain sense, we can say that when we bring your name up in this arbitration, when we point out that other workers, including you or other workers, have committed the same violation. We are not putting you at risk because the employer knows that he can't act against you uh, uh, because he would be violating due process and will win that case. And you will win that case. Now, of course, if you have in your contract 
uh, a clause that requires the employer to take action within X number of days from the day that he, the employer discovers the misconduct. And some unions have a 10 day clause. Employer must take action within 10 days, five days, 10 days, two weeks, whatever, of discovering that the employee uh, violated a rule or regulation. That's great. I hope that everybody can get that kind of language. When you have that kind of language, then obviously, if we were to go to an arbitration and present evidence that other workers violated a rule six months ago, three months ago, well, they're safe. We have, we have perfect contract language. Now, it's also true that when you go to a arbitration and, or you go to the employer in the grievance process and you inform the employer that other employees have been violating a rule without penalty, it is possible that the employer will react to that by uh, informing you that, well, okay, you got me on this. Uh, I'll put that worker back to work uh, because uh, it, uh, you have established that, I, that we have lax discipline. here. But <clears throat> I will issue a rule tomorrow and I will notify those work that the, the workforce that from now on, this rule will be enforced 100%. So, for, for, for example, suppose you have a rule that breaks are 15 minutes. It's 10 minutes. Let's say 10 minutes. But workers have been taking 15 or 20 minutes. And now a worker is punished for that, uh, is brought in for punishment. Maybe he's on a last chance agreement. And consequently, he's, uh, he's, he's, they got that bullseye on his back. He's brought in. And we bring in his defense, we bring out the fact that workers have been taking 15 to 20 minutes over and over for the last six months, last year. Well. It is likely that in that situation that the employer is going to say, all right, you win this case, but I will be issuing a notice on the bulletin board tomorrow that any person who exceeds 10 minutes by even the smallest amount will be subject to significant discipline from now on. This could happen. Now, when that happens, of course, the rest of the workers may turn against the union. Uh, they may say, you save a worker, one worker A, you have cost us all a the benefit of non-enforcement of a rule that we have enjoyed. So you need to take that into account. And I, I, I can understand some situations why a union would not make a lax enforcement argument in some situations uh, to avoid getting the rest of the department or the workforce upset, uh, legitimately upset. On the other hand, uh, if you are defending a worker who has been discharged, has been discharged for violating a lax enforced rule, you're in a tough situation. You, your job in the union, you have to get, we, we talk about discharge, we have a high duty to represent people who are discharged 100%, making all possible arguments, even if it might lead to some discomfort or some upset by some, of the, some other workers. In the case of a discharge, I think we have to make the argument of lax enforcement and then take the consequences. But to tell you the truth from what I've seen, you make the argument, the employer posts the notice from now on, all breaks will be enforced at 10 minutes. Two weeks later, he's back to the old rule, the old policy, 20 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. So it, it's not as, as, as hard as you think. All right, that's what I want. Okay, I can I would just say a couple people are saying there's still a lot of feedback. So um, I don't know what we should do, but maybe just try to be still. I think I'll, how about if I bring the sound down a little bit like that? that might help too. Let's try that. Is that better? It sounds good for now, to, on my end, at least. By the way, let's go back on lax enforcement. One more, one more point to make. Uh, on number three. Um, so the question comes up. Okay, the employer has not enforced a rule. Um, can, does that mean that the employer is stuck? Because he didn't enforce a rule for two years or five years, he can't decide to enforce it. And the answer is no, that's not true. An employer is allowed to reset a rule that has not been enforced. He resets the rule, which, and I use the masculine here, I, I, I'm comfortable doing that, but it's, it's a little clumsy to keep saying he and she. I'll try to do both. He can, re he can she can reset the rule by announcing to the workforce that from now on the rule will be enforced. If the employer posts that notice, uh, the employer is allowed to enforce the rule, even though the rule had not been enforced. And we cannot make a lax enforcement defense. However, what I've seen is within, as I said earlier, 
within a few weeks or a couple of months, the employer will be back to where he was. Uh, and then at that point, we're back to, we can make, once again, renew our uh, lax enforcement arguments. Let's move on to the next slide. Due process. Are we on substantial proof? No, due process, number three. Oh, due yeah. process still, number three, okay. Sorry. Yeah, all right, due process uh, is a very important aspect of just cause. Uh, all arbitrators or just about every arbitrator would agree that part of just cause is due process. What is due process? It's a difficult, somewhat ambiguous term, but it means a fair procedure, uh, uh, handling a case in a fair way, fair procedures. Uh, in the industrial world, we have due process in the courts and civil courts and the constitutional due process, but in the workplace, due process comes down to three <clears throat> or four points. One, it requires an employer to conduct an interview or to hold a hearing before making a decision to impose discipline. To take action without a hearing or without an interview violates due process. The discipline is tainted and the, uh, and the discipline has to be reduced or eliminated. Second, the employer must take action promptly and we've discussed that. That is, he must, if he's gonna take action, he's gotta do it within a week or two weeks or three weeks of discovering the misconduct. He, thir three, the employer must assess charges precisely in the notice, must issue a notice of discipline, which, is, which describes the charges precisely. And four, once assessed, discipline may not be increased. And we'll get to that last point. That's a very interesting point because another, ter another way of uh, defining that last sentence is something called double jeopardy, which a lot of people are confused about. But let's start out with the most important aspect of due process, which is the need to conduct an interview or to hold a hearing before making a decision to impose discipline. Uh, in other words, employers, even when the employer has evidence of misconduct, he has a witness, he has a letter, he has a phone call, um, he sees it himself. Uh, can he just call you in? hand you a discharge notice and send you on your way? Can he call you at home and said, we know what happened today, there was a major accident, you uh, lost a lot of product, um, a patient was, 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 was in need of treatment, uh, we know you're responsible, you're fired. To, to act in this way is a violation of due process because the employer is taking action before you have been brought in and given a fair opportunity to give what? your side of the story. Now, sometimes employers say, this is a ridiculous requirement. In many cases, I know exactly what happened. I have several witnesses to what occurred. Why are you saying to me that I did something wrong because I didn't bring the employee in for an interview or have a, a, a mini hearing uh, before I took, made my decision? And there's some logic to it. I mean, take a case where an employee punches his supervisor in the nose, okay? The employee, the employee, in the middle of the work, on, on the work floor, during work, during work time, uh, there's an argument between an employer and an employee. The employee loses, uh, loses it and smacks the supervisor in the nose, and the supervisor has to get medical attention. It's an open and shut case. Uh, we know what happened, because when it happened, there could be, there's probably two or three witnesses who saw exactly what happened. There's no dispute as to what happened. Even the worker doesn't deny that he hit his supervisor in the nose. Consequently, why do I have to hold a hearing? This is the employer's argument to you at the grievance, at the step two, step three grievance meeting. What is your response? Your response is yes, you do know what happened. Uh, we're not disputing what happened. You know what happened, but that is not all you need to know to, this, to determine what is the proper penalty in a case. To determine the proper penalty in a case, you need to know not only what happened, but why it happened. You don't know why it happened. All you know is that this worker struck his supervisor. There may, have, there may be reasons for that action that explain what happened. Now, there's nothing the employee can say or show that gets him completely off the hook. If you strike your supervisor, you're gonna have some level of punishment. But you, you may be able to uh, show facts 
that explain that uh, that make you less responsible than it looks for what happened, less guilty than it looks, less in need of a discharge. In other words, you have to be discharged. You may not be as guilty as it looks. You may be a person who, who lost it momentarily, did something which you should not have done, but there was a reason why it happened. Uh, there, were, there, were, there was a lot, almost a logical reason why it happened, and, and, and consequently, this must be taken into account. There may have been misconduct on the part of the supervisor that precipitated your reaction. If that's true, that's called an extenuating circumstance. You may have a medical condition that, uh, for which, you lo which caused you to lose control of your decision-making abilities, in which case you are uh, at, you're at fault because you should be taking the proper medicines to avoid that, but you're not guilty of the same type of aggression or assault that the employer assumed at first. So we make the point to the employer that you need to conduct an interview in all discipline cases. There's no, even when you are absolutely certain of what happened. Um, now in a due process case, when you prove due process to an arbitrator, you don't necessarily expect that he's going to reinstate the employee with full back pay. In other words, he's going to say, well, you didn't have your interview. Consequently, I'm going to wipe everything out and make you completely whole. No, because in many of these cases, in most of these cases, perhaps, you committed some type of misconduct. It's just that the employer acted abruptly, acted without consideration of, of your rights as a, to give you a side of the story. And in those situations, what, you, what in most arbitrators will do is reduce the penalty. So if we have a discharge for striking a supervisor in the example we discussed, we would be, we would probably be happy and we would expect not to have the employee reinstated with back pay. He punched the supervisor in the nose, but we would hope that the arbitrator would reinst would, 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 would change the discharge to what? A suspension, a short suspension. Sure. One day, five days, one week, two weeks, but more likely, a long suspension, eight weeks, 10 weeks, even six months in, in, in some cases. In that situation, have you, have you, you consider that you've lost the case? Uh, you have a guy who was discharged for striking a supervisor. You've got him reinstated. Uh, he's got a, let's say, not a six month uh, suspension, but let's say a one month, 30 day suspension. That's a severe suspension. That's a, that's a very difficult for the employee to, to live through. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you've lost the case, that you haven't done a good thing. Uh, you've kept, you've uh, helped that employee to keep, keep his job. Um, and that's the most important thing. And in those cases, I, I, I would categorize that as a win for the union. It's also true that in many of these cases, even during the period of suspension, the employee can file for unemployment benefits. And we're very successful at the unemployment office when it comes to uh, suspensions, getting the employees um, uh, benefits for suspensions. And that's a whole other story. The last point on due process, I'm going to skip the requirement to uh, take action promptly. We've covered that. I'm going to skip the requirement to list charges precisely. But the last point is interesting. Once assessed, discipline may not be increased. What are we getting at here? We're getting at a situation where a supervisor imposes a penalty on a worker, a five-day suspension, a one-day suspension. And then goes back to his office or her office, thinks about it, makes a couple of phone calls, speaks to somebody in human relations and realizes that that penalty was much too lenient, that perhaps they were influenced by the fact that they liked that worker or whatever. Calls that worker back in that day or the next day, explains that uh, I was too easy on you. I did not take into account the fact that you have prior uh, misconducts. So consequently, I'm gonna have to change that Mm -hmm. um, that one day suspension to a 30 day suspension. Or sometimes they might say, we're gonna change the 30 day suspension to a discharge. In other words, they've increased the penalty based on reconsideration. We call this double jeopardy. And that is accepted definition of double jeopardy in the workplace. Double jeopardy outside the workplace, such as uh, 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 in the criminal courts um, is, a, is a different question, different way of looking at things. In the workplace, double jeopardy means imposing one level of discipline, reconsidering, and imposing a much higher penalty. That is a violation of just cause. 
we win a lot of cases on that, on, 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 on double jeopardy. Let me give you a couple of examples. A bus driver is driving his, her bus and uh, she hits, she comes to an intersection, she hits the brakes too hard. The passengers are thrown forward. One passenger in particular hits her head against a column and there's a little blood. Uh, she complains, of course, to, to, to the bus company. The worker is called in. He admits what happened. Um, the uh, company says, well, this is very serious. You, vi you, you, you were negligent in the way you braked. Not only were you negligent, you caused injury to a customer. You're going to be given a 30-day suspension. That's our highest penalty, second to discharge in this workplace. Okay. The worker serves, begins to serve his or her suspension, her suspension. Two weeks later, what happens? The customer dies from the blow, suffers a hematoma, blood clot, and dies. Well, now the worker is called back in, and the employer says, uh, well, this case has changed. We thought you had caused a, a light accident to, a, uh, to, a, to, to one of our customers. Turns out you killed the customer. Uh, this, this is, uh, you know, we have lawsuits now gonna come at us from the family for uh, uh, causing the death of, uh, of an individual through negligence. Um, it's a bit, the, the press is making a tremendous case about this in the, in the town. I, I cannot keep you in this situation. You killed a customer. Uh, I'm gonna have to let you go. Well, there's a logic to that. There's, I mean, you killed a customer, you know, uh, that's about as bad as you can do. But uh, from the point of view of labor relations, we're gonna win that case in most, you know, we're not gonna win it in every arbitrator because there's such a subjectivity among arbitrators. Uh, one arbitrator may do X, another arbitrator may do Y. So I can't guarantee that you're gonna win the case. We have a solid argument to make. If we get a veteran arbitrator, not a brand new arbitrator, a veteran arbitrator who has studied labor relations, who has studied the rules of just cause uh, and has understood the precedent of those rules, we get that kind of an arbitrator, we're, gonna have, we're probably going to get a reinstatement because double jeopardy was violated. He, that worker was given a penalty. And that worker understood that penalty to be a final penalty. When you gave that penalty the 30-day suspension, you didn't say this is tentative or this is temporary. You didn't say, we're giving you a 30-day and then we'll look at the case down the line. You said, we're giving you a 30-day suspension and that's that. And you, went, and, and, and you prepared to go back to work. And you would have gone back to work. So consequently, it is, uh, it, it, it's unreasonable to, uh, uh, you had a reasonable expectation that that was a final decision. And uh, we'll, we should win that case and get that worker reinstated. Another case, a work, workers are playing uh, cards during a break and they are playing poker and they're betting money on their game. They have money on the table, okay? Supervisor walks into the break room and sees money on the table. This is a violation of company rule 26, no gambling on the premises. Supervisor, you know, goes nuts, screams a little bit and tells, uh, and, and reads the riot act to those five employees and tells them if they ever do this again, they're out the door. The workers say, okay, and they go back to work. At five o'clock, those workers are called in and the supervisor says, you know, I've thought about this, I've talked to human relations. I was too easy on you. I'm giving you each five day suspensions. This is a serious rule. We've had problems with this rule in the past and uh, uh, I should have given you a suspension to, to begin with. We're gonna fight that on the grounds of double jeopardy because once again, we were given a penalty. We understood reasonably that that was a final penalty. Um, consequently, you are not able to increase that penalty just because you review the employee's records or look at the history of that of how that rule has been applied. What does this mean in practicality, practic practically? When you have a, uh, an employee and you're investigating agreements, somebody comes to you, I suggest that you ask this worker, okay, you have, you've been given a, some discipline for unsafe behavior. Let's say you're a forklift operator. You're not supposed to run the forklift backwards. You're only supposed to run it forwards. You run it, fo you run it backwards, they see you and uh, um, they give you a, 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 a five-day suspension and a three-day suspension. Okay, case looks bad. But now I ask you, I'm your steward, I'm investigating just between you and me. Has this ever happened before? Ha, uh, oh, well, first I ask you this, when your supervisor saw you 
running the forklift backward. Did he say anything to you at the time? Did he chew you out? Did he reprimand you on the shop floor? Because if he did, if he reprimanded you on the shop floor and then later imposed the suspension, we have an argument for double jeopardy because you were chewed on the shop floor and you went back to work. You thought you had a reasonable belief that the discipline was over, it was final. Consequently, it's double jeopardy to in, in, increase that discipline. Now, what can an employer do who, who, who uh, does that mean that uh, an employer always has to hit you with the most heavy possible discipline? Uh, it cannot possibly go through a deliberation process. No, you can be observed engaging in misconduct. You can be reprimanded. You can even be sent home, but and, it, but, and the employer can preserve its rights. How? By saying to you, I'm sending you home. I want you to come in tomorrow. We're gonna to discuss it further. We're gonna discuss it with human relations. We'll see what happens. We're gonna review the case again tomorrow. Now, when, when the employer does that, okay, you, you understand, you should understand that this case is not over. This case is ongoing. This investigation is ongoing. And it may lead to a harsher penalty, a higher penalty. It would not be reasonable for you to come to the conclusion at that point that you have received final discipline. And that's what kicks off double jeopardy. You have to have a reasonable belief that you have been given final discipline. Um, so um, uh, let's consider that whenever we investigate cases, uh, has, uh, uh, what is the history of the discipline in, the, in this particular case? Let's go to the next slide. Now we have to move faster. Substantial proof. Charges must be proven by substantial and credible evidence. Well, this is a big topic. Um, what is good evidence? What's bad evidence? What is sufficient evidence? I can say this, to, to short circuit the discussion, employer must have credible evidence. Employers may not take action based on rumor, uh, based, based on implication, based on guesswork, they must have witnesses and they must have, uh, 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 they must have documents that can prove their case. Um, one of the biggest things you're gonna do as a steward in investigating a case is to demand all the employer's evidence. And the, uh, the, the state of the labor law, the labor board is very bad right now in Washington, the NLRB in particular. And they've issued a lot of decisions against unions in many areas of, our, of union rights. The one area where they have not taken a lot of active action on is union right to information. We pretty much have the same rights to information now as we had before Trump. I recommend that a union submit a written request for information in every discipline grievance. And we do that at this, immediately, at the same time that we file the grievance, we either attach, and it's called an RFI, request for information, we attach it to the grievance, or we submit it within a couple of days. Within that request for information, we are demanding all of the employer's evidence. We want, we want in particular any, the names of any witnesses who the employer is aware of or who the employer interviewed. If the employer conducted interviews, we want to have copies of all notes taken during that interview. If the employer obtained a statement from a witness, we want a copy of that statement. If the employer has photographs, that relate to the misconduct, we want copies of those photographs. If he has voice, uh, any kind of voice documentation, we want copies of those. If the employer commissioned uh, an investigator, uh, an investigation before he or she took action, we want a copy of the investigator's report. If the employer has received a recommendation from the investigator or some other party recommending particular type of action, discipline, uh, suspension or discharge or whatever it is, we want a copy of the recommendation. We are entitled to all of those records and we'll get those through the request for information and, 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 and if we don't get it from the employer immediately, we will take those requests to the NLRB in the form of an unfair labor practice and we'll probably do pretty well uh, on those charges. Now, one of the other points, I wanna skip a little bit on proof, a topic that comes up a lot in union grievances, which is hearsay. 
hearsay. Hearsay is a form of proof. It's a weak form of proof. It's not the best form of proof. The best form of proof is eyewitness proof. The second best form of proof is what's called circumstantial evidence, where you have evidence which implicates or uh, implies, uh, A implies B, that's circumstantial. Not as good as eyewitness, but not, 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 not worthless. The third type of proof is hearsay proof. Hearsay proof is evidence against a worker, which comes from an outside party, uh, but a party who is not willing to subject himself or herself to cross-examination, who is not willing to testify in person at a grievance meeting or at arbitration. Hearsay is anonymous evidence. It's not fair evidence. Why isn't it fair? Because we're not given an ability to confront the accuser, to find out why the accuser made this charge. What did the accuser really see? Did the accuser have something to gain by making this charge? Is there a history between the accuser and the accuser? We have, that's gone when, you, when an employer tries to rely on hearsay. Here's how arbitrators deal with hearsay. They don't completely exclude it. They do allow employers to put it in if the employer has other substantial and credible evidence. They will allow an employer to put in hearsay to, to, to support uh, a case which is proven otherwise. But if all the evidence an employer has against their worker is hearsay, and there is no first-hand evidence, and there is no circumstantial evidence, then most arbitrators will not sustain a significant penalty, a discharge or a long suspension. So, example, a worker refu uh, refuses an order by his or her supervisor, disobeys an order. The supervisor, of course, is upset, fills out an incident report, goes to human relations, the worker is brought in, he deny, he, he's questioned, he denies it, he qualifies what happened, he says that's not really what happened. Um, nevertheless, they fire him for insubordination. The case is then grieved by the union and goes nowhere. The union then decides to take the case to arbitration. When we get to arbitration, what happens? Well, all the employer has to do to win the case is do what? call in the supervisor to testify. The supervisor, first-hand witness, I gave an order. The worker thumbed his nose at me uh, and did not fulfill the order in any way. That's enough to win the case for the employer. However, what may ha what often happens is that for one reason or another, the supervisor does not show up to the arbitration. Why is that? It could be many reasons. Supervisor could have been fired in the meantime. It happens a lot. Supervisor could have quit. It happens a lot. Supervisor could have retired. After all, we're talking sometimes about a year between a grievance and an arbitration. Supervisor has retired. And in some other cases, and I used to make a joke about it, but I won't, but in some cases, the supervisor dies in the, in the interim. In any case, the supervisor is not there to give firsthand evidence. What does the employer do? He doesn't give up because he wants to win this case. So in nine out of 10, the employer will submit, will try to, will submit the the incident report that the supervisor filled out when the activity occurred. It's all written down, signed by the supervisor. It's an incident report. It may even be notarized. Some employers might even ask their supervisors to notarize. Well, now the employer says, I'm introducing in the absence of the supervisor who died or who is, who is living outside the, the, the state. I offer this uh, incident report as evidence of what happened. Uh, what will happen in that case? This, the arbitrator will take the document. He will accept it. We used, a lot of people think he won't take it. He'll accept it he'll, as an exhibit. He'll mark it, accept it, it goes into the record. But in the end, when it comes time to write the decision, if that's the only evidence against that worker is the incident report. And since that incident report is pure hearsay, an out of court statement by someone who is not making themselves available for cross-examination. In that situation, a decent arbitrator or a better arbitrator will not sustain a discharge. He might reduce the penalty, he might to, to, to something, something lesser. He will not sustain a discharge or even a long suspension. Now, if the worker is given a one-day suspension for this activity, he'll probably let it go by. Is it, you know, it's hearsay, but not that big a deal. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sustain the, the, the one-day suspension or even a five-day suspension. 
that if we're talking about a 30-day suspension or a six-month suspension or a discharge, based on hearsay, uh, most good arbitrators will not al allow that to happen. So uh, this doesn't necessarily mean, however, that in all of these cases you win the case. And why is that? Because when you come in, for, because when that incident occurred, they call you in for your disciplinary interview. Don't forget, under the due process, they have to have a disciplinary interview. Otherwise, the case is flawed on that ground. So you're all, most employers know that now, and they do bring people in. Now, when you come in, they're going to ask you, did you disobey the order from the, from the supervisor? If the worker admits that he disobeyed the order at the disciplinary interview, and then tries to justify why he did it, that worker is sunk. Because now when we go to arbitration, the supervisor may not show up, or doesn't show up. But the employer has other substantial and credible evidence. What is that? The admission, the confession by the worker at the undisputed confession at the disciplinary interview that he in fact did refuse the direct order of the employer. We're gonna lose that case. Now think about that. When you are representing someone at a disciplinary interview and the evidence against that worker you know is hearsay. And moreover, you are pretty sure that the accuser is not going to come to any arbitration that the union might go to. Because the, you know that uh, maybe it's an anonymous accuser. Let's say that you work for a, a utility company and you go in and you check people's uh, meters and an anonymous letter comes to the company accusing you as the meter of being rude or even worse, uh, harassing the customer. Okay, you're now called in for the interview with your steward. And they ask you, did you do this? Um, if you were sure that the customer was going to come to the hearing, you might answer the question and you, you, you might decide I'm going to I'll have to admit that I did it and try to explain why. Try to show remorse, because remorse is a very valuable legal concept. Uh, we win a lot of cases based on remorse, but we'll put that aside. But if you knew that this is an anonymous letter that came to the company, an anonymous letter, there's no way in hell that person is gonna show up at an arbitration. The company doesn't even know who wrote the letter. You know that the evidence against you is, is hearsay. Consequently, you, have an, you, are, you, you are in a different position. When they ask you, did you do it? What are you gonna, you're the steward, what will you advise your member to say in that situation? Think about it. Uh, I'll leave it at that for right now. Let's move to the next couple of slides. All right, equal treatment. We, uh, equal treatment, let's read it. Unless justified by a valid distinction, an employer may not assess a considerably stronger penalty against one employee then it assessed against another known to have committed the same or a substantially similar offense. This is a very important principle. We win a lot of cases based on lack of equal treatment. Why is that? Because when you treat people differently and you give one employee a lenient penalty and another employee a more severe penalty for the same basic misconduct, what's another name for that? Favoritism. Favoritism goes against the very core of just cause. Almost all arbitrators react viscerally to the, when favoritism presents its face during a hearing. It's wrong. It's unfair. It's racist. It's, it's a number of things. And uh, consequently, when we are able to show favoritism, unfair treatment without cause, we, can, we, we oftentimes will have the sympathy uh, of the arbitrator. When we prove uh, failure to, uh, to a, a, a another name for, equal, for winning equal treatment is called disparate treatment. So that's another term which I use. Disparate treatment is what happens when you treat people differently. When we prove disparate treatment, we would expect that the arbitrator, if he's hearing the case, would reduce the penalty. He's not going to wipe out the penalty. He's going to reduce your penalty or the worker's penalty to the same level as the worker who got the special treatment. Favoritism exists throughout all workplaces. Even though employers constantly preach to their supervisory staff against favoritism, treat people the same, they know that unions win these cases and get back pay some, many times. And uh, they're constantly explaining to supervisors, you can't do that. You've got to treat people, apply the same levels of punishment for the same 
violations. Nonetheless, nonetheless, favoritism is rampant throughout almost every workplace. Nonetheless, almost every supervisor commits favoritism. Why is that? A lot of factors. The worker may turn out to be someone who's the best worker in the shop, the other worker. Consequently, they're not going to fire that worker uh, for, for a rule violation, for a relatively minor rule violation, or even for a, a severe rule violation. They're going to give that worker a second chance or even a third chance. It may be that that worker uh, uh, is a friend of the supervisor. It may be that that worker is a relative of the supervisor. It may be that that worker is, I think, that that worker has been informing on the union for 10 years. They're not going to fire that worker when uh, he, he commits, he violates a company rule. They're going to give that worker a, a more favorable, a lenient rule. We need to bring that out. If we can show that another worker got a lenient um, uh, penalty, a much more lenient penalty without a valid distinction, because notice if you have the rule in front of you that an employer can justify difference in treatment by a so-called valid distinction. It, without a valid distinction, favoritism really goes to the core of due process. So, by the way, what is a valid distinction? What would justify giving one worker a one day suspension or a written warning and another worker a two week suspension? What, would, what, would, what could possibly justify for the same misconduct? Let's say you're a driver and you have an accident from negligence. You're another driver has this, almost the same accident from negligence. You give one worker uh, a, a written warning and you give another worker a three day suspension. What could justify that? Well, there are some things that could justify it. For example, if the worker who got the lenient penalty, the lower penalty, if that worker had been there for 40 years and the worker who we're representing has only been there for a week, that's a valid distinction between two workers, a, a distinction that justifies a difference in penalty. It could be that uh, the worker who got the lenient uh, uh, treatment um, has a perfect record, has never had any prior discipline and is also a great employee in every respect. Well, that's a valid distinction. If the worker we're representing has a checkered record and uh, is not really that cooperative a worker. It may be that the worker who got a lenient uh, penalty came, came to the disciplinary interview and confessed the, admitted to the, uh, to, the, to the misconduct and apologized for the misconduct, threw himself on the mercy of the employer, promised that he would never repeat the misconduct. And on top of all that, agreed to go into any kind of counseling program the employer would advise because this employee really wants to stay in the workplace, stay in this job and loves the job and loves the boss and whatever and whatever. So this employee has shown honest remorse. The employee that we're representing, he came to the disciplinary interview and pretty much gave the finger to the, to the employer, did not admit anything, denied everything. No, I didn't leave the premises. No, I didn't violate the rule. No, 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 no. Uh, denied everything. Denied he was at work that day. So he didn't, re he, there's no remorse here. There's, there's no regret. Uh, there's no willingness to go into a program. That is a valid distinction between two employees. In that situation, it's not favoritism to give one worker a low penalty and another worker a higher penalty. In order to win a case on equal treatment, and we win a lot of them, we have to do research, a lot of research. We have to go into the history of the workplace and discover at least one other employee who committed the same type of misconduct and got a much lesser penalty without a valid distinction. Um, that takes work. Uh, uh, for one thing, we need to get the names of all other employees who were disciplined in any respect for that type of misconduct. Then we have to look at their personnel files to see what the penalty was. Then we have to go through the personnel file to see if there was anything good in the file or anything bad in the file that would in some way differentiate them from the employee that we're representing. We, uh, we have to submit requests for information that demand the names of all other workers who were disciplined or who, or who were investigated for the same offense. Not only employees, but former employees. There may be a former employee who uh, was given a second chance or a third chance. 
we're, our guy wasn't even given a second chance. That's disparate treatment if we can get, uh, get, bring out the facts. So equal treatment requires investigation, request for information, and work. But it pays off. It pays off. Let's go to the next one. Number six, progressive penalties. Well, we talked a little bit about this uh, earlier in the evening, but uh, I just say this. Some employers say, well, we don't have to observe progressive discipline because it's not in our contract. Uh, other contracts have it written into the contract, not this contract. Consequently, we can apply any level of discipline on any level of offense. And uh, some unions buy that. But uh, if we take that case up, and we, if, if we challenge that, uh, I, in most cases, we'll find that the arbitrators uh, don't, don't agree with that. Uh, they read progressive discipline into the words just cause. If you have the words just cause, that's just the same as writing progressive discipline or progressive penalties into your contract. Progressive penalties mean that we start out with a low penalty, then we move to a middle penalty, then we move to a severe penalty, then we move to discharge. Basically a four-step process. Allowing the employer in some cases to skip a step when the misconduct is severe. Um, let's go on to the next one. Mitigating, extenuating, and aggravating circumstances. Um, discipline is expected, must be proportional to the gravity of the offense, taking into account any mitigating, extenuating, or aggravating circumstances. So this, uh, we win a lot of cases on this element also. Uh, not so much the first part of the definition, but the second part, mitigating and extenuating circumstances. Many times employers don't take into account all of the mitigating and extenuating circumstances and they move immediately to penalty and they don't consider uh, factors that uh, should be considered when determining whether it's necessary to impose a severe penalty. After all, what is the purpose of penalties in the industry, in the workplace? It's not the same, as I said earlier, as penalties in the criminal system. In the criminal system, we give a penalty on a criminal to punish him for what he did. Uh, that's a big part of the reason for a penalty and for the size of the penalty. Punishment is not a notion that has got any credence in the workplace. The purpose of workplace penalties is as much as possible to, co to, to help the employee correct what he, understand what he or she did and correct their misconduct and return to work as a valuable and uh, employee who observes the basic rules of the workplace. Rehabilitation is basic to punishment in the workplace. Consequently, if there's any factor which suggests that this employee um, could be a good employee, could come back and could, could learn from his experience and could be a better employee and, and could avoid any repetition of what happened, those are factors which need to be considered by the employer before he determines whether he has to fire this worker. Because firing somebody is something that firing is something you do when you have no other choice. You cannot possibly rehabilitate that worker. He's hopeless. He has committed the same thing over and over and over. He shows no regret, no, no remorse. Um, that worker is hopeless, okay. But other workers aren't, don't fall into those categories. All right, what are uh, 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 mitigating and extenuating circumstances? Uh, there are several in each category. Extenu let's talk about uh, mitigating, let's talk about, excuse me, let's talk about um, mitigating circumstances first. Mitigating circumstances are aspects of the employee or his or her background that suggest that that employee does not need a severe punishment to correct what happened. What would be a, a mitigating circumstance that would, that would credibly make that suggestion. Well, one of them is long service. A worker has worked uh, for an employer for 10, 15, 20 years, has shown a loyalty to the workplace, a dependency on the workplace, and that worker can be expected to correct his or her misconduct. Doesn't need to have a big penalty. Doesn't have to have you suspended to realize that they have to avoid rep repetition of the misconduct. And uh, a long-term employee may only need a written warning. That may be sufficient uh, to, 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 to uh, let a, a long-term employee know that they have to make a few changes. Uh, 
uh, and certainly a, at the most a one day suspension if 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 uh, if, if necessary. Um, what else? What else? What else? A good record. Obviously, an employee who has a very good record. That's an extenuating sort. That's a mitigating circumstance that suggests that that employee uh, takes pride in his or her work and will improve. The fact that an employee has been disciplined in the past is not necessarily terrible. If an employee has received minor discipline in the past and has not repeated that misconduct in the future, that is, four years ago, an employee was rude to a customer, the librarian was rude to a customer, okay? And the customer complained and it was, the worker was called in and was given a uh, written warning or a one day suspension. It's been four years, that librarian has never repeated that rudeness, it has never come up again. What does that show? That shows that that worker can learn from a light penalty, can learn from a reminder, can learn from a minor little slap on the wrist. When that worker gets a slap on the wrist, that worker reacts favorably, correctly. Consequently, those are mitigating circumstances that show we don't have to come down hard on this employee. What about extenuating circumstances? Extenuating circumstances are circumstances that come from, that show that part of the reason this, these events occurred came from outside the employee. That is, they were the result, they were caused by other people, namely management, supervisors or co-employees. We have a situation where, yes, an employee probably did something wrong, but part of the reason for that was that the supervisor provoked him, the supervisor was harassing him, the supervisor was increasing his workload unfairly, uh, the supervisor, uh, uh, or another one, the supervisor had failed to, workers brought in uh, for violating rules, turns out that supervisor did not train that worker, or trained that worker very poorly, or explained the, the, the procedures very poorly. That's an extenuating circumstance where some of the blame goes on management. If some of the blame goes on management, then the penalty that you might otherwise impose should be lowered, should be lowered, because it's not all the fault of the worker. Um, the last category is, uh, in this list is aggravating circumstances. Well, we don't like aggravating circumstances. Aggravating circumstances allow an employer to impose a harsher penalty than would otherwise be expected because of the employee's poor record or poor attitude. Um, and let me just finish by just saying a one or two words about attitude. Uh, you can have the best case in the world on paper. Uh, and you can have the best case on the rule on documents and uh, uh, on cross-examination. But if you have an employee, if you're representing an employee who has a miserable attitude, who comes to the grievance session or to the arbitration and, is, and is, has a miserable attitude, uh, uh, scornful attitude, um, a very uh, uh, hateful attitude, or whatever, you wanna, however you want to describe it, we're going to lose the case. We're going to lose the case even if we have the best evidence in the world. Arbitrators are human beings. If they feel this worker doesn't care about the workplace, is not going to be a good employee, he's going to go, they're not going to put someone back who two days later is going to do the same thing again or something worse. So a lot of the work that we do when we prepare workers for grievance sessions and for arbitrations is grooming them to have a pleasant and a honest uh, approach and presentation in terms of how they dress, what they say, how they approach things, the politeness to the arbitrator, to the whatever. Uh, and you might say, well, you're selling out if you do that. But I, I think, I think uh, any lawyer would do that for his client. And you are basically lawyers for your clients in these cases. So that finishes my presentation. We have we've gone over the 90 minute, 80 minute mark. So I'm willing to take a few questions though, if anybody has any more strength. So let me just check the Q&A for now. Um, and I encourage if people do want to ask questions that they try to not be so specific, um, try to make it something that could be useful to everyone on the call. Um, so somebody asked, what about zero tolerance policies at work, such as workplace violence or sexual harassment violations, where first offense is termination and the worker was denied just cause by not getting a chance to tell their story? Mm -hmm. Well, of course, we have a problem with zero tolerance policies, ZTP. Uh, we hate them. We, do, we, don't, we don't like them because they essentially send an employee to capital punishment on the first offense. Um, employers love them um, and uh, you know, throw them around as much as they can. Uh, 
Our position in the union, in most cases, is that zero tolerance policies violate the contract. Zero tolerance policies allow an employer to fire a worker on the first offense. Um, and uh, just cause, on the other hand, requires the employer to take into account all factors before making a decision, not to make an automatic decision. And, zero, and just cause requires uh, a, a progressive discipline approach with the fact, understanding that in some cases, uh, there are cases where progressive discipline doesn't fit. Where an employee you know, assaults another, another worker, a coworker, and badly injures that coworker, you're gonna fi probably get fired on the first offense. There's probably nothing that could be, that would justify it. So if an employer you know, wants to issue a zero tolerance policy for a egregious assault, with a weapon on another employee, I don't know that we would make a big fuss about that. But if a zero tolerance policy is published, which imposes discharge for things like gross negligence, for things like insubordination, uh, for things like safety violations or lockout violations, things which are not self-evidently egregious, so egregious that there's no way you could expect that employee to stay in the shop. Well, then we, 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 we object, and when we go to arbitration, we argue to the arbitrator, this zero tolerance policy violates the just cause clause. It's a violation of the contract. Unfortunately, some unions have agreed to zero tolerance policies. They agreed to it even in the contract. I have seen contracts where the contract lists the following activities as justifying immediate discharge. And the union has signed that contract. Well, that's very upsetting. And we should never, a union should never, never, agree to immediate, uh, immediate discharge. It violates every concept of just cause. Uh, at least they should never agree to it except in the most narrow of circumstances, murder, uh, substantial theft, um, arson, etc. But as far as a broader zero tolerance policy, we should never agree. If, and uh, if we've agreed, then we're in big trouble. Because once we agree, almost every arbitrator will say, you agree to it. Uh, it doesn't make sense. I don't agree with it myself. Uh, it violates basic concepts of just cause, but you agree to it. Um, but if we didn't agree to it, if it's just a unilateral determination by the employer of what constitutes grounds for immediate discharge, we, we, we fight that tooth and nail. Okay, so there's another question um, that says, how do you feel, it's from Zachary, how do you feel arbitrators will handle discharge cases surrounded COVID-19 related policy violations? Is there anything that we should be looking for? Well, uh, of course, there, I think this comes, would come under a topic, uh, uh, generally, it would come up under the topic of refusing, refusing unsafe work. Um, and there's a chapter in the handbook called Refusing Unsafe Work. Uh, we, we, we've long uh, fought for acceptance of the notion that under some circumstances, an employee can refuse a job assignment if that job assignment requires him to do something which could cause serious uh, illness or injury. And if that job assignment is outside of the normal requirements of the job. So the jobs which uh, involve a risk of serious injury all the time, I mean, that's the nature of the job. A lot of so many construction work. If you aren't working on the 20th floor, you're at risk of serious injury every minute of the day. That doesn't mean you can refuse to work on the 20th floor. That's a customary part of your job. But uh, it is well accepted that an employee can refuse a job assignment that could lead to serious uh, injury or death and is outside of the normal risks of the job. Uh, the question, of course, is proving that, that a co an assignment to work in a workplace uh, which, uh, where you, you could get COVID-19, is that really uh, outside of the normal risks of the job? Um, I think in some cases it could be, but you would probably have to show one, several other cases of COVID-19 by other employees, okay? You'd have to show some evidence that those cases arrived uh, in the workplace and not in normal daily life because if they arrived in no, normal daily life, that would change the risk level. You would have to show that the employer is not doing nearly what it could do to protect, the work, protect you in the workplace. 
I haven't seen decisions. There's going to be decisions. There's going to be arbitration decisions on this issue. I haven't seen them yet. Maybe there have been some. And if there have been, I would love to read them. But, um, uh, you know, if you take a look at that chapter on, uh, in, in the handbook, it'll give you some ideas and it'll give you some arbitration decisions that you could cite as, as precedent uh, for refusals to work in an unsafe work. So I'm going to combine the next uh, couple questions that I see. So is it a, the question is, is it appropriate for an employee to be, or can an employee be disciplined for non-work related or offsite arguments or altercations with the supervisor? And the second part of the question is, what role does social media play uh, in all this? Well, uh, yeah, that's a common question. Um, uh, can the employer discipline me for what I did outside of work? Um, and there's a host of possible scenarios. The general rule, the general rule is no, is that what you do outside of work is your business and not the employer's. That it only becomes the business of the employer if what you do affects the workplace, affects the ability of the employee to operate the workplace, to make money in the workplace, um, then maybe yes. Then if, what, if, if, you, if you commit some type of misconduct outside of work, and it affects the workplace in a negative way, yes, then discipline can be imposed. It's called, that's called a nexus, N-E-X-U-S. If the employer can establish a nexus between your misconduct and what happened at the workplace. Now, this give you one example. A worker, uh, I don't know if you remember, but several years ago, there was a, a um, period where workers were streaking, where people, people were like to streak in the uh, outside of their homes, uh, and go outside, go in the streets take off their clothes and run through the neighborhood um, without any clothes on. It's called streaking. I don't think it happens as much now. Life is more boring now. But um, there was a worker in one workplace who made a bet with another worker that he was, uh, as soon as the bell rang, he was going to uh, leave work, take off his clothes and run up and down the street in front of the factory uh, without any clothes on. He was going to streak in front of the workplace. And he did. And he was fired. Uh, and it went to grievance and then it went to arbitration and the arbitrator reinstated him. He says, I don't approve of what you did. It was silly. It was in bad taste. It was, you know, some people were bothered by it probably, but it didn't really harm the workplace. It wasn't written. There was no discussion about it in the local newspapers. At least if there was a discussion, it didn't name the name of the company. It didn't hurt the company's business or lose any business. Uh, it didn't, when you, when you come back to work the next day, it doesn't affect how you're going to be able to do your job. So he reinstated that worker, I think, with back pay. But there are examples where a worker goes to a bar and the boss walks in, one of his supervisors, and the worker is pissed off and has a few too many and gets into a fight and knocks the supervisor out. Now, that's an off, con off that's, that's misconduct outside of the workplace. However, does it have an effect in the workplace? Yes. Because when you come back to work, are you going to be able to work with that supervisor? Are you, is that supervisor going to be able to work with you? Probably not. It's going to interfere with your ability to function as a reliable, effective employee. In that situation, uh, an arbitrator may very well sustain a discharge. So it all depends on how it affects the Uh, there's a question. Is a union member's right to fair representation violated when a union representative chooses to represent only uh, the one employee and completely disregards another? How should that be handled? Well, certainly uh, a union, uh, if there's uh, several employees who have committed uh, the same type of misconduct at roughly the same time, uh, the union should probably represent them all. That doesn't mean that they represent them in the same way. Mm. Uh, they should certainly file grievances. Any worker who is disciplined, even when the worker is in the wrong, the union should, if the worker wants you to file a grievance, file a grievance. I can hardly imagine a reason not, not to file a grievance. A grievance just means we'll have a discussion about it at the first step. It doesn't commit the union to anything. And uh, for a union not to even file a grievance, uh, I think that, that would be a, a chancy. That worker could, could file charges. After all, when a union doesn't represent someone fairly, that work that, that employee has the opportunity to file legal charges against the union, either at the federal labor board, if we're talking about the private sector, or at the state labor board, if we're talking about a public employee union. And that's kind of messy for the union, 
may even cost money. I paid a lawyer. So uh, 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 we need to do something on behalf of all the employees. But we might take, if we take one, case, one worker's case to arbitration or to third step, doesn't mean we have to take everybody's case to arbitration or the third step. Um, it's hard to, it's hard to, it's hard to, uh, we have to be careful. I guess I put it that way. We can't be blase about it. Because for one thing, the National Labor Relations Board on the national level is showing a big interest in facilitating charges against unions. This is the, one of the big, Trump, this is the Trump Labor Board, one of their big contributions. We, we, we're not gonna go against employers, we're taking them off the hook on many levels. But if you come in here and show me a union that didn't file a grievance when it should have filed a grievance, I'm gonna charge that union, and I'm gonna haul them in here, put them in legal proceedings, force them to spend $10,000 for a lawyer, I'm gonna mess them up. So this is the attitude of the NLRB at this point, and we don't wanna give them, we don't wanna help them in any way do that. Do you wanna take a couple more? All right. Oh, it okay. says streaker, streaker. Okay. <laughs> that, um, I'm going to just combine, I'm just gonna throw a couple at you because they're kind of short. One of them is a due process question. What if the employer keeps, uh, keeps saying we are still investigating the matter? At what point is the promptness not being followed? And the other question is, in my intro to labor study class, we learned that no employer, the employer is not entitled to the union's notes or evidence, which is true. Uh, right. Well, the first one is a little a more general. Uh, uh, employer is investigating some type of misconduct, harassment, safety violation, and just never, and, and, and keeps investigating, keeps investigating. The worker is nervous, of course, during this whole time. What's going to happen? Uh, and demands that I want to make a decision. Let me know what you're going to do. Is there a rule about it? No, no, no. I don't, I'm not sure there is. I mean, you can say to the employer, you're, you know, labor relations concepts require, expect you to take action promptly after you learn. You're expected to conduct your investigation in an expeditious manner. If it's, you know, I don't know if a month is, ex is, is too long, but six months sounds crazy. And, you know, and uh, if, you, if you come down and impose any discipline at this point, I'm going to raise this in the grievance process and in the arbitration, and you're going to lose the case. I mean, this is the way you could talk to an employer. But the other question, which is one, the other question? Yeah, the other question was, um, you know, basically a question about like, does the employer have, uh, is the employer entitled or allowed to see the notes and the evidence of okay. the union? That's a good question. That's a real good question. Uh, because a lot, you know, a lot of times unions are a little, uh, bamboozled. They get, we have been for years hitting the employers with detailed and long requests for information. And anybody who reads any of my books is doing that every day. So employers are upset about that. And one of the ways they react is by hitting us with equally long and detailed requests for information for records that we really don't want to give them. So we have to know what the dividing line is. And there is a dividing line. The dividing line is that, uh, one party cannot demand from the other party documents that were prepared uh, because of pending litigation or future litigation. So uh, if you prepare a document in anticipation of litigation, that's called a privileged document. You don't have to turn it over. So let's, let's take a look at the, at the typical grievance. An employee is discharged for poor attitude, all right? And the employer has a file this thick of all the cases where the employee exhibited poor attitude. We demand that file. We want to see that file. Um, are we entitled to that file? Yes, that file is relevant to the decision, both uh, as to whether the discipline should have been, been imposed and how much discipline. Um, the employer... Is, is in a tough position. You know, he says, I'm not giving it to you. It was prepared in anticipation of litigation. And there's a rule about that. Well, as it turns out, um, that's not true. That document was prepared as part of daily business life to determine what type of penalty to impose on that employee. Litigation was not on top, on top the, the main issue here. And when and employers do investigations all the time, they investigate employees. They look it up and they look at what happened and then they determine the penalty. There's no anticipation of litigation. Consequently, we're entitled to all those records. 
Now you have the union's grievance file, which the union begins to prepare after the union, after the member files a grievance, or, or, or soon, before, soon after, soon before a grievance is filed and soon after. So we have a grievance file where we have our interview notes, our thoughts, some documents which we've accumulated. We don't want to give that to the employer. And our, our reason is that we prepared the grievance file in anticipation that it would be used in a present, presented at a grievance meeting at, or an arbitration. That is litigation in the industrial world. Litigation in the industrial world includes grievance hearings and arbitrations. We prepared our grievance file in anticipation of litigation. That is arguments about the case at grievance or arbitration. Consequently, the, 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 the labor law precedent allows us to withhold it from you. We don't have to give it to you. On the other hand, you still have to give us your grievance file because you prepared that before a grievance was filed. And you prepared your grievance file as part of your determination of what penalty to impose. So in that sense, we have the winning hand uh, when it comes to those two arguments. You ready for a couple more? Sure. How long? Because the fireworks has... I, the fireworks hasn't started here yet, and uh, <laughs> uh, so consequently, it's a little quiet out here right now. In about, in about 10 minutes, we're going to have enough fireworks out there, and you wouldn't hear me, so. Everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> um, somebody asks, uh, does, the Skelly the, does the Skelly hearing count as the investiga investigatory hear uh, meeting, or does an investigation meeting need to occur before the Skelly hearing? Well, of course, he does. Uh, that term Skelly hearing is a term of art. And in, as, as I understand it, uh, and I never represented police, uh, and I guess I never will represent police, but uh, in, the pol in the police world, uh, there are certain concepts uh, that relate to when a policeman can be, a police officer can be interrogated by internal affairs and in what way. And in some situations, uh, some kind, there are some legal cases in different states which allow police in some situations, police officers to refuse to answer questions. And that relates to this Skelly hearing. So that's as far as I can go with it. I don't know the answers to all those Skelly questions. I never handled it myself and it's, a little, it's quite confusing. So you'll have to go to someone who's a specialist, specialist in that, of which I don't know anybody. No, I do know um, somebody. I do know somebody. Okay. Uh, somebody says, can a union negotiate their wine garden rights away? If the contract mentions that for investigatory meetings, the steward will attend, can the employer block the union staff representative from doing the investigatory meeting? Uh, well, I think generally the answer is yes. A union can bargain away any of its rights. For instance, so we all know we have a right to strike, but we bargain, almost every union has bargained either way. There's a no strike clause in almost every union contract. We are the court, the, the board, and the court say we are allowed to bargain our, tell it to bargain away any of our rights. One of our rights is to have stewards at, uh, is to have uh, representatives at wine garden meetings and to pick the representative. Um, so can we can we can we limit ourselves by language in the contract? Yes, we can even we can probably even agree to a contract clause that says that uh, uh, an employer will not. Uh, that does not have to bring in a union steward, even if the worker requests it. I, I, I guess we could agree to that. So the answer is yes. Uh, it's no good. It's wrong, but we could do it. Terrible. <laughs> if the contract does not include a grievance procedure, can information still be requested that goes beyond mandatory topics of bargaining? Well, uh, well, that uh, generally speaking. Um, our rights to information are very broad, but they are restricted to what's called the mandatory subject of bargaining. Those things which directly relate to workers' terms and conditions of employment. Uh, I mean, for example, if you work at General Motors and they're deciding whether to build an electric car, that's not a mandatory subject of bargaining. They, the company has the right to determine the product it wants to make. Um, <clears throat> so even if we file a grievance that you should be building more electric cars, uh, and then we ask for information about that decision making, of course, the employer wouldn't have to give it to us. It's not a mandatory subject of bargaining. We're only allowed to demand information about mandatory subject of bargaining or other items that 
directly affect employees' uh, terms and conditions of employment. So, um, I don't know if that answered the question. I forgot what the question was. Um, I think that answered the, right. the question. We'll deal with it. Um, in cases of member versus member harassment, racial, sexual, et cetera, does the union violate its duty of representation by demanding disciplinary action be taken against the harasser? Demand that the harasser be fired, for example? Yeah, or disciplined in any way by the employer, is what this says. I have to think about that one. I mean, uh, in this climate, in this climate, uh, when the board is filing charges against unions willy nilly for the slightest uh, degree of uh, conflict with their members, um, I have to think about it because we don't want to be put in that situation. Um, uh, we don't want to be face the possibility of uh, having to pay back pay that, to that work, to that, that, that person who was fired because we asked for him to be fired. So I have to think about it. It's not, it's not, uh, it might be something that we have to be dance around. We might not want to directly demand that. I, I think we have to be very careful, very careful. Uh, although I suppose in, there could be extreme cases where we simply have no choice. John Whitelaw asks, how does, how does unilateral changes of conditions of employment go with the fair notice with the new uh, NLRB? Well, that's a big question. It's not directly on discipline and discharge. Okay. <clears throat> that really relates mostly to an article I just wrote for Labor Notes. Just got published. I just got my copy of the magazine today's mail, uh, although it has been posted on Labor Notes about a few weeks ago. But... Um, there's been a lot of changes and developments when it comes to uh, midterm bargaining uh, and unilateral changes. And an area of the law which had been very favorable for unions under previous administrations, Obama administration, Clinton administration, even under many Republican administrations, under the Trump administration, under the Trump labor board, has been totally eviscerated and has been torn apart to the point where uh, one of the board members who uh, was in the minority, uh, the final Democrat on the board, basically threw up her hands and says, we're back to 1935. We're back to the period before 1935 when employers had no restrictions on uh, making uh, changes during the, contract, during the life of the contract. So it's a, we're in a, in a tough situation. We have to hope that uh, we get a new administration in Washington and that whoever comes in appoints new NLRB board members who will restore our midterm bargaining rights. Um, but unfortunately, that's a long, fairly long process. It's not something a new president can do the first day or even the first year. It usually takes about two to three years for a new president, say, say such as Biden, to be able to get three members of the five member NLRB such that they could change or reverse policy. So Biden may come in 2020 and he may, he may not be able to get control of the NLRB for three or more years. So we may have to live with this. It's a very bad situation. But if you read my article, I give you a strategy. I have tried to develop a strategy to overcome the latest changes committed by the NLRB. It's called uh, shut the door on management's rights. Mm -hmm. So several people are asking the same question, which is how do you handle an employer who won't have dialogue during the grievance meeting? They won't answer questions. They won't state their case. They only say to us, present your case, and then they leave the room with no discussion. Lots of people ask. Well, uh, I mean, if it happens once or twice, there's not much we can do. We just take, we, can, we have the option of moving the case to the next stage and eventually going, moving it to arbitration and, you know, uh, just, bypassing everything. Um, an employer who completely uh, mistreats the grievance process, and that can be done in many different ways. He might take away authority from his representatives to settle grievances. He might refuse to settle any grievances, have it just have a policy. I will not settle any grievances until arbitration. So there's, very, there's a number of different arbitrary ways that an employer can destroy the grievance process. When it gets to be very severe, we could try to file an unfair labor practice at the NLRB contending that 
the employer's approach to grievances over the past six months shows a lack of good faith in, its, in, 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 in resolving grievances. There have been a couple of successful cases along those lines uh, where we have shown that the employer is trying to bankrupt the union, trying to force us to arbitrate every case, taking away all authority from their people to resolve cases. And we have won a couple of those cases, but by and large, it's not, it's not the type of misconduct that lends itself to resolution through the ULP mechanism. I think direct action demands on the employer to, to, uh, to, to uh, you know, the way we approach any other on the job problem, direct confrontation with management on the job, non-cooperation, informational picketing, uh, boycotting of uh, uh, secondary targets such as customers. Uh, these are the various tools that we can use on the job to put pressure on an employer to do right by the grievance process. And that's in another one of my books called uh, No Contract, No Peace, also published by Lady Minutes. Somebody asks, when, uh, when should we make a demand for information after receiving an investigator's report or at the post-investigative meeting before the discipline? When's the best time to ask? Well, we know we are entitled to information as soon as the employer imposes the penalty. So as soon as the employer imposes the penalty, the door opens for information. I think what you're asking about, and I've thought a lot about this too, is can we get information before discipline is, the disciplinary decision is made? In particular, they call the employee in for a disciplinary investigation. It's gonna be at two o'clock. And we know the subject, we know what it's about. So now we submit at this point, a demand for records, <coughs> documents, statements, photographs that the employer has accumulated at this early stage before it has taken any action. I, I, I don't think we'll get it. I don't think the board would order them to supply it. I think the board pretty much feels that this is pre-disciplinary activity. It jeopardizes the investigation. An employer ought to have an opportunity to conduct an investigation, make a decision, and then the, employee, the union can challenge it. So I haven't seen successful cases where unions have obtained information prior to the employer making the disciplinary decision. Although we're interested, we're curious, we're certainly curious, but uh, the curious is not enough to get, the, to get those records. Do you wanna take two more? Okay. Are there privacy rights when requesting uh, for substantial evidence who was interviewed and what they said during investigatory interviews? Well, uh, it depends. Generally, no. Generally, the, the, board, the board, board law NLRB law has been that uh, witnesses uh, they give a statement to management. They know that statement is going to be used in legal proceedings and grievances and arbitrations. They, they shouldn't be surprised if uh, other people uh, find out about it. Um, on the other hand, there, there are situations where an employee is very nervous about the union finding out that he gave a witness statement. Uh, and it might be a situation where the person who is the target, who, the person who, who is going to be disciplined is a, is a very angry person, someone who has uh, assaulted other workers. So you're afraid if you, if, if, you tell, if you tell the union, if he finds out that I gave a statement against him, that he harassed me or he was rude to me or he, he, he uh, uh, solicited me or whatever, that he's going to beat the crap out of me. If this is a legitimate concern on your part, then the board would say in that situation, the employer can assert a confidentiality interest in the witness's name. And in that situation, uh, can, has to, will meet, can meet with the demand that the union bargain with it. How can we release the information that you want, namely the name, without jeopardizing the worker who gave the statement? Is there any way we can do it in such a way to protect the worker who gave the statement? For example, Instead of giving the name to the union in general, we give it to one particular person, or the union, maybe we give it to the union lawyer, because we think the union lawyer won't disseminate it to the, to the bargaining unit. So it's a mixed bag, that's all I can say. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. 
Okay. Um, there's a lot of questions about this. So I'll just do this and this will be the last question. If a person may have violated a rule from a long time ago or a long time ago, I guess, but the employer just finds out about it uh, much later, can they have, uh, can they still discipline if, you know, if there was no clear date, can they audit a worker's computer and, and launch an investigation for something that was like maybe say a year or more ago that they just are now finding out about? Well, theoretically, yes, I, I would say yes. I mean, the rule is that an employer must take action promptly after discovering misconduct. If an employer discovers misconduct that occurred two years ago, because all of a sudden a worker comes in and says, two years ago, that worker assaulted me in the elevator. So I just, the worker just learned about it today. Can he call that worker in and question him? Yes. If that worker admits what he did, can he punish that worker? Yes. If there's other evidence uh, that it occurred, could, can he punish? I would say yes, because he's taking action promptly. He's investigating promptly, he's taking action promptly. Now, sometimes in these kinds of cases, we win the case because there's a concept called stale evidence. Evidence that is presented to an arbitrator as to what happened, it's two years old, three years old. We argue a lot of times, don't credit that evidence. It's just too old. Too old, too, it's happened so far, long ago, we, it's not fair to us. We can't go back and check it out. Uh, we can't locate witnesses. People have died. You're talking about something that happened two years, five years in the past. But it, I, I would not say that an employer is totally barred from going back a year, two years to impose discipline uh, concerning misconduct that he just becomes aware of. If you said five years, I would say, yeah, no. I, I can't imagine an employer going back five years and imposing discipline. It's too long. It's stale. All right. Well, thank you so much, Robert, for everything. I believe so many people have given so much good feedback about um, how this is super useful to them, both here and on Facebook. Um, I'll remind people that we will share the slideshow um, with participants, um, as well as the recording uh, will be available online. And this is a first of um, a in a series. And so we'll come back. Uh, we'll be back with Robert on a host of other topics that he writes about um, grievance and arbitration and labor law and strikes and, and things like that. Um, and I also encourage you all, I put the link to the Labor Notes bookstore in the chat so that you can go directly um, to buy the Intro to Just Cause book, um, as well as others that are available that Robert mentioned tonight um, on the call. Good, I enjoyed it, you know. Uh, I'm in my uh, retirement. I have uh, more time than I usually, I, used, I usually have. I enjoy having an opportunity to interact with people and uh, I, I, uh, I just wish I could see all your faces. <laughs> Thank you so much. Have a good night, everyone.